Hey, Ying Ying. Yeah, Brendan. Would you like to tell the people what we're doing here? You mean with the cold open? Yes. Well, we have been wanting to freshen up the show and talking about ways to do it. That's right. One of the changes we're making is having a cold open like this, where we set up the show a little before we even start the theme music. A cold open is when someone starts talking with no setup or music or anything. You just dive right in. Why don't you do that part? Sure. This week's guest is Jay Thornhill. Jay is the co-founder of Bao Pals, a service you know very well. Yep. Bao Pals is a website that makes Taobao and Tmall, China's e-commerce shopping <laughs> giants, accessible to the world in English. Taobao is pretty great, but if you don't read Chinese like me, it's almost impossible to use it. Bao Pals is actually one of the most respected foreigner-owned businesses in China. We'll hear a lot more from Jay himself in just a moment, but first, how about we play that music? Sounds great, and you have another surprise for us there too. I do indeed. Check this out. I love it, and it's a little familiar. I know. That's because I had it written for my other show, If I Knew You Better, which has been on a bit of a hiatus. Hey, check out the big John Williams swell right here. Fancy! I really like that. Thanks. My friend Carl King composed the other music we've been using for my original podcast, Big Fish in the Middle Kingdom, where I met you. But as this show has become what it's become, we've talked about changing it up a bit to something that fits our more grown-up direction a little bit better. So we're trying this on for size. And we hope you, dear listener, will let us know what you think. You can visit HowChinaWorksPodcast.com and find the contact page to tell us if you like the new music. Ask us questions about the show to book us as guests or speakers for your show or event, and more. We'd love to engage with you. You can also find out more information about our guests, like Jay Thornhill here, to listen to any of our other shows, or even to pitch yourself as a guest. And if you're deeply involved in cross-cultural business or issues, and are something of an expert or pioneer in your field, we'd love to have you on the show. We'll be making updates to the website itself over the holidays too. So let us know your thoughts for what you'd like to see, and we'll try out the ideas we like the best. Speaking of people with great websites, why don't we start the interview with Jay now? I couldn't agree more. Stick around after the interview for a few quick follow-up thoughts from the two of us here. But for now, please enjoy our talk with Jay Thornhill. We're here with Jay Thornhill. Jay, how are you today? Doing great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for being on our show. Yeah, I'm actually a,、um, a fan of the podcast.、Uh, although I just discovered it when we connected, but I've got a huge backlog that I need to check out because、uh, <laughs> it's like a really great podcast you're doing. Oh, thank you very much, man. We we yeah, we're, we're very proud and have had some diverse guests, and we're really glad to have you on because. We talked a little offline. You and I have some common world, real friends. Although we've never met, and you're down in Shanghai, of course, we're up here in Beijing.、Um, give us just to get started. Give us sort of the short version of your bio. You know, brief brief snapshot of where you're from, how you came to China, and just a few bullet points of your journey. And then we're going to get into the details. Right. Okay.、Uh, well, I'm a 33 year old、uh, Australian American, born in Australia, grew up in the U.S. I came to Shanghai when I was 21 after graduating university,、um, and my plan was to be here for one year, and that was、uh, over 12 years ago. So I just stuck around、uh, because I, I felt like there was good opportunity here,、um, and I decided I wanted to work for myself、uh, in my early 20s, and so I've been、uh, working towards that goal ever since. Very, very nice. So mostly your、uh, entrepreneurial journey started in Shanghai. Right. Yeah,、um, I was I was working as a teacher my first year, as many Americans do when they come to China, and then I became a freelancer, and I did all kinds of things. So、um, I was, you know, doing.、Uh, I was still teaching. That was kind of my bread and butter.、Um, but I was also emceeing in shopping malls for marketing events. I、uh, <laughs> nice. I, I was doing voice acting. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was doing all kinds of stuff.、Um, I even did investment banking for a year in Hong Kong、um, before coming back to Shanghai.、Um, so I really bounced around. Yeah. So when it comes to when and why did you start Bao Pals, which is quite interesting name here,、um, can you share with us a little bit what is the origin story of, of Bao Pals in a very brief way? Yeah, and maybe even give a tiny little capsule for the handful of people who don't know what Taobao is. So. <laughs> 
kind of kind of sure. kind, kind of assume that my mom is listening to this back in Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, so it's funny that people outside of China, for the most part, haven't heard of Taobao. Um, yet everyone knows Alibaba at this point, and Taobao is uh, so closely associated with Alibaba here in China because it is their shopping platform for um, for domestic Chinese or, or really anybody living inside of mainland China. Um, and it's since expanded outside of China. But essentially what Taobao is, is the go to shopping platform for everyone in China. It's their Amazon and their eBay combined. Um, it's where you can uh, buy pretty much anything you could imagine, whether it's uh, products or services, whether it's from uh, somebody in your neighborhood who's got their own little uh, arts and crafts project or whether you're shopping from uh, top global brands like Apple and Nike. Um, it dominates the e-commerce market here in China, um, and it has uh, for over a decade. Um, and so essentially what we wanted to do is, is take Taobao and make it more accessible to people like us, foreigners living here in China. And I can talk more about that, but essentially that's the, where it started. That was the genesis. Right. And because, uh, again, people who aren't familiar with it, you know, Taobao is completely Chinese, as makes sense for a mainland Chinese company. And it's so massive. I mean, I'm sure you would have actually granular insights into why they haven't tried to do like an English skin. But I imagine the task of that is almost impossible because the individual sellers are uploading their information. And so you'd be relying on like a translation bot and that's not going to be very accurate, et cetera. So how, how do you, I mean, how do you crack that nut? How do you deal with that? Do you have a, a, a team full of, uh, team full of people in a back room somewhere who are going through and translating the, you know, the most popular items? How does, how does it work with Bao Bao's? We would need a team of, you know, millions of right. people if we were actually going through and, and translating it all ourselves and right. trying to keep up with it because it, uh, there are about a billion products on Taobao right. and it's changing all the time. So um, we're, we're a tech company essentially. And what we needed was a tech solution. Um, and we knew that, well, the reason we decided to do it wasn't because we had background with Taobao. We had no background in e-commerce whatsoever. Um, we just knew that this was a problem that we faced. And when I say we, I mean uh, my two co-founders, Charlie, Tyler, and I. Um, at the time, uh, about four years ago, Charlie just listed out uh, several problems that he faces because he wanted to start a company. He, had, he didn't really know what he was going to do. Um, but every good idea starts with a good problem. Um, and this was such a clear problem to us uh, and to any of our friends, because we know that shopping on Taobao must be great because all our Chinese friends and colleagues would, <laughs> right. we, we just could. Um, and the language barrier was, a, was obviously a major part of that. The entire platform is in Chinese. So if you can't read or write Chinese, um, it can be real difficult to use. Um, but there's a lot more as well. I mean, we, we didn't have Alipay accounts. It was right, much harder right, to get. Right. And as a foreigner, um, and and the way that the website is designed, the entire user interface, user experience is catered towards Chinese because they are the the market for sure. that platform. Um, knowing what you want to buy, right? There, there's the list goes on. Dealing with deliveries, customer service standards, and expectations. Um, so we we knew that if we could solve those problems, that we would really have something. Um, and it started with the tech because. We did not want to be a very kind of like heavy or manual type of business model. Right. Uh, we, we wanted to simply be a bridge, to be an interface. Um, and so we looked into how we might do that. And, and when we discovered that there, are, um, that there are ways to get the data that we needed, there are APIs, and I probably won't get too technical, sure. um, but there are, there are ways to get product information um, and, and seller information Basically, the main the main things you would need to make a purchasing decision, um, or at least to get started on one, um, and so we were able to gain access to that. You can't just you know you can't just grab it. You need to get right. access, um, and Taobao has to make it available to you. Fortunately, uh, they did, um, and then we started with the search capability and auto translation. Right. So when you search on our platform, you can search in any language, and we will auto translate it to Chinese in an instant. Um, and bring back all of the relevant results from Taobao and Tmall. And just a quick side note, Tmall is part of Taobao, but it's for uh, it's for licensed brands. That's where you get all your flagship stores and Nike and right. H&M and so on. Um, and so, yeah, the 
the information about products and sellers and, and delivery tracking, all of that is automatically translated mm -hmm. uh, by our platform. So you get some pretty funny English. <laughs> yeah. um, I've seen a little bit. <laughs> Right, like you might be looking at uh, at a you know a Christmas sweater, and it won't just be called men's Christmas sweater; it'll be called men's Christmas sweater, holiday knitted wool, fine, warm autumn and winter. <laughs> right, right, right. It so, kind of it kind of wraps uh, a lot of information into it. Right, but it's enough to know what you're buying, um, and then what we did uh, is you know build around that technology and and come up with a new interface for shopping on Taobao and Tmall. Um, getting rid of all the things that you don't want to see as a user um, and, and just bringing the relevant information, organizing it in a way that makes sense um, and really also, you know, like recataloging all these products. We built all of our own departments and categories yeah. um, and search suggestions. Um, a big part of what we do is content. Um, and I've just got a water delivery knocking on the door. So. Okay. All right. You go get that and we'll pick this right back up. So you're back mm -hmm. from your water delivery. Is everything in order as it should be, I hope? Yep, all is well. Got two big jugs of water for the water cooler, so it should be set for a while. Fantastic. Well, I was actually just about to pounce on you with a follow-up comment, which is essentially saying, I mean, you answered a lot of things we were going to prompt you about on that because – I, of course, have used your, your service and I, I speak a little Chinese, but I don't read and write. And so like my girlfriend helped, helped me set it up. I mean, I have formerly an assistant and then my girlfriend helped me I'm, set up. How was the experience? Oh, well, I, oh, I use Taobao all the time, but, <laughs> but I'm going to talk about Baobao's. So what I want to say is that, that, you know, with Taobao, if you want to use it, but you don't read Chinese, and I'm saying this kind of for the sake of the rest of the, of the audience who doesn't know it. Um, as you're saying, it's, it's organized for the Chinese consumer naturally. And also just there, there's sort of become like a, a way that people organize things here that's very different than we do in the West. So that's, that's part of what I really appreciated about Bao Pals was how it is very intuitive for a Westerner in the same way that I assume Taobao is, is intuitive if you're Chinese. I mean, I can use Taobao, but only because I had my old assistant like programmed all my address information. And then like when I had to update my credit card, my girlfriend helped me with that. But that's a hassle. And then still, still once in a while when I'm using Taobao, I've gotten something that's not what I thought it was. <laughs> Or I've gotten like yeah. three of them when I thought I was getting one of them, you know, because I missed some question. So, so, uh, we, this isn't an advertorial show, but kudos on the interface. It's, mm. it's really, uh, it's really friendly Thanks. as a user. Wow. Yeah, appreciate it. I actually was our first designer. Um, oh. fortunately, we got a real designer um, a bit <laughs> later on. We, we've gone through a couple of redesigns. Um, but yeah, we just kept it simple, you know, and, um, and we wanted, we don't have any advertising space. We don't throw pop-ups at you or like yeah. little mini games to play and collect your reward type stuff. Right. Um, we just try to focus on, on what the customer wants and that's an easy shopping experience and finding good products uh, and so, getting good so, service. So let, let me, let me ask what do customers want? <laughs> because that's very important to you serving mostly, um, expat here in China. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, we may so go international. So, what kind of uh, feedback? What kind of uh, request generally? Well, one thing that we have not done much of uh, from the beginning is the, the sort of like focus group marketing that you might get at bigger companies. Um, in the early days, it was really just the three of us on our own, and so we kind of acted on instinct. We kind of knew from our own experience. Uh, what we wanted. And we looked at what worked in the West in terms of uh, websites like Amazon.com, Walmart.com, Target.com. Because even though we had no experience in online shopping, online shopping is fairly straightforward because it's something for the masses. So generally the same desires for our customers apply anywhere. You want, uh, you want to be able to easily search for products and uh, find relevant results um, you want good products to rise to the top so that you're not digging forever. You want to know that uh, what you're buying is reliable and fairly priced uh, or competitively priced. You want to know what options you have and uh, have them be clear to you. Uh, if you need any, if there's anything that you don't understand, you want to be able to get an answer on it before purchasing. 
Um, you want easy payment options. You want fast delivery. You want customer service to be very responsive. Um, and if anything goes wrong, you want them to be on the case, whether you know whether you you ask for help or not. You expect someone to have your back. At least our customers do. And and so yeah. So the as far as feedback from customers uh, since we we opened it, um, we do get requests here and there, but we tend to try to uh, think of things that they're not requesting because. Uh, the requests that you normally get are things that are quite uh, obvious. Sure. Um, but what we try to do is think of, you know, what's the feature that nobody has asked for, but that we could create and then uh, and then just take take a gamble that it's something that they'll use and that they'll enjoy. So you started with a team of it's three, team. Right? three founders, but I, I assume that yeah, I assume you've staffed up a bit. How many how many people are there at Valpals uh, Inc. Unless that's a trade secret. <laughs> no, no, no secrets. Uh, well, there are secrets, but that's not one of them. Um, so we've grown to about 40 people now. Um, and so from three, three American, well, I'm Aussie American, but pretty American, if you could tell by my accent, three American founders. Um, and then now we are about uh, like 25 Chinese and 15 foreign staff, um, or maybe like 23 and 17. And so the team has changed quite a bit. Well, we were wondering, you know, what is that like for you? Because, uh, I mean, Ian and I both work across cultures, and so we understand this is part of why you're really an ideal guest for us. What's it like to really manage a multicultural staff? Because we were talking just about, like, you know, the user expectations being different. What are some of the different expectations that the staff has between your, your, your Eastern or Western staff, and how do you kind of deal with all of that, keeping people happy? Yeah, um, well, that's always been a priority for us, um, keeping our people happy and keeping ourselves happy. So those things go hand in hand because, um, you know, if you make a happy work environment, then we all benefit. And we started out working in our apartment for the first year. So you definitely want your work environment to be cool because that's where you're also spending all of your, your non-work time as well. Right. Um, and I think because of working in our, in our home, um, and having, you know, our first employees, like our first 10 employees actually work out of the apartment with us, um, created a real kind of informal family type environment, mm -hmm. um, which isn't always uh, that common, um, well, in the West or the East, but sure. I think particularly here in China, it's not super common. You know, people people do take their jobs very seriously out here, um, and they tend to be a bit more formal when it comes to, say, hierarchies. Right. One thing that we kind of, uh, that might have caught some of our Chinese staff by surprise is that uh, as we're, we're technically the bosses, but um, we weren't really above the work, and we don't take ourselves very seriously. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are, we're happy to embarrass ourselves. We're happy to, you know, joke around, have lunch with everybody, um, and and not carry ourselves uh, as if we're these kind of deities. Sure. Um, you know, not that all not that all bosses in China do, but often you do but feel many, but, that. But, but many of them do. I'll I'll just say it, so you don't have to. That's okay. <laughs> Sure. So, so I don't yeah, make I, you or, or Ying Ying say it. I'll just say it. Right. So fair enough. So, I mean, that's that was one of the first things. Um, and so we had to we wanted to build a team um, of people who uh, could relax in that sort of environment. Um, and I think it's a bit of a learning curve for some people that join us. But then at the same time, the, the company has evolved and it was easy to do that and keep it very informal and flat uh, in the first year or two. Um, but now with about 40 people and, and also we literally have a hierarchy of floors because we're now working out of a, a three story house nice. with the bosses nice. on the top floor and, wow. um, and people, tech team and people who work closely with us up there on the top floor. Um, but in, we're in separate rooms, you know, and then our operations team take the whole second floor and, uh, and then the, the ground floor is kind of the fun floor with the ping pong table, the pool table, <laughs> nice. the kitchen area. <laughs> so mm -hmm. yeah. for, for Bao Pao's, um, what is, uh, what is the team look like right now? Have, do you have more like, um, yeah, I think um, you said 23, 17, male, female, how is that broken and Chinese, up and male, female, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. different parts of China. Right. Diversity. Um, yeah. we've, we've got, we've got a bunch of different countries represented too, um, but we are about, yeah, like 60, 60 to 65 percent Chinese now. Um, we are about 60 percent female to male. Um, and that's uh, well, there's a there's a few reasons for that. Uh, one reason I think we've uh, leaned more towards female is because more 
more shopping is done by our female shoppers, uh, which may not surprise everyone, even though there actually, you know, there are more male expats than female expats in China. I don't have a number on that, but it's something that's just kind of, uh, I think common knowledge. It's kind of obvious, um, yeah. As a as an expat, and yeah, it's it's pretty much a given. And the traffic on our site um, is about fifty fifty, male to female. But the females spend a lot more time on the site, and they consume a lot more of the content. Um, they look at the departments a lot more. They read the articles more. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's made sense that our like content team has shifted to be mostly female in order to to serve those customers' needs. But also our operations has become mostly female. Um, and that's simply because uh, I think it's easier to find ch female Chinese who speak uh, good English than it is to find male Chinese that uh, speak and write uh, well in English. I think language learning is something that gears more towards uh, females in education here. Ying Ying, I don't know if you would disagree with that, but uh, she, she's nodding in agreement. I'll let her speak for herself, of course. <laughs> well, I would say that um, I'm quite. Uh, I, I'm, I'm interested in giving you a challenge right now uh, because I was trying to Im imagine like uh, the consumers on your website and looking for uh, the best product they want. But I'm also interested in learning about how fierce uh, the competition really is uh, for mm -hmm. someone like you in this particular sector, which is really because I have many friends, a lot of uh, female entrepreneurs, um, you know, Chinese studied abroad and coming back and uh, working in this sector, e-commerce. So there's a lot of competition out there. So I'm, I'm just curious to know about your views on it and how to do deal with it. Yeah, well, we we were quite fortunate because we're we were the first to market, at least as far as a you know English Taobao and Tmall uh, shopping solution, a really comprehensive one. We were the first to do it, um, and the reason for that is not is not because the idea was so clever. It was because nobody knew how to do it, um, or nobody nobody that maybe there were some that knew how, but they didn't realize the potential of it. Um, because it's very tough to do what we did, technologically speaking. Yeah. Um, and it's also tough to uh, build around that into a brand that and platform that foreigners like and trust. Um, so you really need to have a team of uh, both Chinese and foreign uh, to do what we did. And you also really need to know the tech. And and I think you need uh, you need Chinese tech people. Let me go ahead and write write a blueprint for potential competitors. Um, <laughs> well, I'm taking but, notes. You know, we're recording you, right, really. So. So. <laughs> Great. So um, there's not much competition as far as our niche. You know, serving right. the expats who want to shop on Taobao and Tmall. But of course, there's loads of competition for e-commerce in general. But um, I still feel like for us, competition has never been a grave concern because we. We are serving the expats in China, and e-commerce in China is largely serving just the Chinese. Exactly. Um, and every exactly. once in a while, they might experiment. You know, ah, oh, let's like try catering this to foreigners. But it's such a tiny market compared to the 1.4 billion Chinese shoppers um, that nobody is really doing it at, in in such a dedicated way um, as we have. And so that's where we've been able to stand out. Well, this is what I wanted to follow up with you about, and and you really, I mean, you know your business, but in terms of putting it out there for people in in a, in a nugget of information, you really hit it on the head. Because first of all, as you said, you know, a lot of Ying's friends, of course, are Chinese, and they're catering to Chinese consumers, so they have the concerns of that market and the crowding and 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 the massive competition. And what you said about you know you're you're one part tech, and then you're one part culture and you, there's your corporate culture and there's your culture to your consumers and the fact that you understand the western consumer so without maybe getting too granular about um, giving your competitors a roadmap i don't really think you have any I and mean, you would tell me if there's anybody that's that's in your rearview mirror nipping at your heels but um why do you think so many startups that are trying to cross bridges specifically fail you know, because I mean, to me, the, the, one of the obvious ones that I'm getting at is, is what you, what you brought up on your own, namely that understanding the culture is key. This is Inging and I, this is, this is, this is one of our pillars of doing this show is trying to bridge those yeah. cultural gaps, but you can't just, you know, you, you can't cliff note that you can't just, uh, like have the, have the one paragraph Wikipedia 
entry and then magically you've learned about how to deal with culture. What what are some of the things that you keep in mind as as guideposts as you navigate problems and even maybe think about other businesses, for instance? Well, before Baopals, I my bread and butter was, you know, education and I worked as a corporate trainer. Um, and so I was delivering a service to Chinese to uh, where I was not the end consumer of it. And I did well when I was on my own. You know, I, I had great clients and I was um, able to make a nice living. Um, and then I thought I could scale that up. And so I, I joined with others and we started developing an app. And that's where I, re- I had to sort of eat some humble pie because I worked for a long time on this app idea, developing content for it, thinking that that I knew what uh, Chinese wanted um, and that they would respond positively to it without really getting that sort of feedback along the way. Okay. Um, and uh, what was so pleasant about doing Baopals was that uh, I was making something that I wanted um, and I shop on Baopals for pretty much everything that I need to this day. You know, just looking around my apartment, I, it's hard to find something I didn't buy on Baopals. So, nice. so yeah, the, you, you really can't um, – you can't overstate how important it is to know your customer. Um, and if you're, and a lot of foreigners who are trying to do business in China, they are drawn in by the allure of the Chinese market, by how big it is, and, and they see that as potential. And oftentimes, I think they don't realize that uh, it's really tough competing with the Chinese at their own game. Sure. Um, and and I, you do see, I think, more and more foreigners starting businesses for other foreigners because they realize that, and that's an underserved market that they really can know intimately. And there's there's way less competition for. So um, I would never dream of of adapting our platform or making a new e-commerce platform to target Chinese. I just right. don't think I I'm capable whatsoever. But, you know, what I can do is, and what our team can do uh, is serve expats because we've done that from the beginning and we figured out a nice uh, style of content and uh, and design and experience that um, that works pretty well here. And I think by being also just a last note on that, by serving the expats here, we don't always have to kind of abide by the rules that the the big companies and the corporates out west do. I think the expat market here is a bit um, is a bit more understanding if you want to kind of get cheeky and have a bit of fun. And, <laughs> yeah, we, um, we, and we, so we we grade on the curve here. Well, that's right. great and, on the curve because we have to <laughs> because we're already behind yeah, the curve. <laughs> right. And I think maybe people are a bit more uh, maybe just a bit more open minded and flexible and then the type of people that would, you know, uh, up and leave and come to a place like China. That's a different world entirely. You know, I, I think can uh, can have a bit more fun when it comes to how you want to present your brand. So um, we we let our brand kind of be our voice in a way. So if we like to to find crazy products and have a laugh about them, well, then our, our customers can too. Yeah, that's, so that's been, I think, just part of our style and, and the real difference between us just targeting expats versus us trying to target Chinese and expats. So know your thing and do your work are <laughs> really, really important. And when, when for every entrepreneur, they want to start well and do well. And, but what would be the next uh, biggest challenges that, um, or actually, what would be the challenges for now and the next uh, possible opportunity for Bao Pals? Yeah, so the challenges you face kind of change along the way, right? Um, and even though we've matured over the past four years, there's no shortage of challenges. There's always something that comes up, some whether it's some change in technology on Taobao's side that is going to force us to um, you know, make some some modifications in order to keep our site working properly. But I think the the operations we have now are going really smoothly. We we don't have the kind of challenges that we used to have as far as building the team, training the team, adapting the processes. Um, they they're so great. They're extremely efficient um, at their jobs now. We've we've created tools to make their jobs easier um, and to service customers more quickly and 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 uh, more appropriately. I don't I, I don't worry at all about our operations. Um, we we have very little turnover, um, and so they're going to be fine. So the challenges that we tend to have um, are on the technology side. And that's usually because we're creating them, um, because we want to build new things. And uh, and a couple of the big challenges on the horizon are we're finally going to build Android and iOS apps, wow. um, which we haven't really needed. 
you know, because we have, we have WeChat here in China. And if mm-hmm. you just get an official WeChat account and you have a mobile friendly site that you hook up to it. Yeah, yeah, um, mini programs do, um, and yeah. in the ecosystem, right? Right. I mean, we don't even we don't even need a mini program. We we really just use the official WeChat service account um, and people can live chat with customer service there. They can shop the platform and pay directly through WeChat through the official service account. Um, so we haven't needed apps, but, you know, having an app would set us up for uh, potentially going international, which is uh, the biggest challenge. And that's the thing that we're going to look at um, next year. Um, and we have an idea. We have an idea of how we might do it. And it's a it's a very different idea than what we were working with in the past when we were like gung ho about doing our own warehousing and having a logistics partner right, and really right. being hands on. Um, I don't know how deep we want to go into that sort of model, but we want, we still want to go international. There's still a need for it. We get contacted by people overseas all the time wanting to shop. Um, but we want to do it in a very light way. That's more aligned with, uh, Alibaba's own systems. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and, and we won't get too 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 in the weeds on that. But actually, I was just I fell down a rabbit hole in YouTube last night, as you as you do sometimes, um, and actually got curious. And it was about how people how how the YouTubers make their money, and and, and talking about the uh, was the Amazon FBA, how they are reselling stuff on Amazon that they buy from Taobao in bulk <laughs> is the gist of it. Is like you know most of the 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 YouTuber influencer types buying these products, pushing these products in bulk and then placing their own ads, et cetera. Um, so the fact that you mentioning doing apps and that you could go international, I assume that opens up all kinds of, I mean, all kinds of cans of worms. I mean, you're not doing the fulfillment and the shipping, right? That's all through Taobao. Right. So as it is now, yeah, the Taobao and Tmall sellers ship directly to uh, the customers. Um, that gives you the fastest and the cheapest shipping. Um, and so the customers themselves can track the delivery and our team is there to communicate uh, if needed. Well, so one other, let me, let me kind of piggyback on this general train of thought and, and let's, let's, let's widen the lens out a bit from Baupal's. What are some things that you could maybe share in terms of Inging sort of was, was getting at this, I think. Um, what do you see as some of the near-term future, near and medium-term future challenges. Well, let's, let's, let's focus on opportunities actually for others, not, not in your exact sector, but just in general. If people are coming from outside China and they want to do business here, work with China, what are some of the things, I mean, whether it's low-hanging fruit or whether they're the, the fruit at the top of the tree that you, uh, that you have your eye on that you're willing to share with us? Yeah. Well, um, I've been trying to talk to more and more foreigners coming here wanting to start businesses um, because it's something that I'm interested in, but also because it's something that we want to help them with. And I think that there's a lot of fear among foreigners about like the the legal waters about, um, you know, can I really just like create my product and start selling it? Will I get in trouble? Can I um, can I just have people like paying me through WeChat? What kind of licenses do I need? There's a lot of uh, a lot of apprehension up front because uh, I think they have the misconception that China is very serious about regulating any new business. And I think that that like kind of can't be farther from the truth. I think that China, if at least from my experience and, and from people I've spoken to, I think China understands that uh, a new business, a small business needs to get it needs to have some space to get off the ground if you burden it with lots of regulations and barriers then you're not going to um you're not going to get new businesses and and i think um china wants new businesses they want they want more online businesses as well they want to shift more toward a service and tech uh economy um and so we're often telling foreigners that want to get set up here like okay look don't overburden yourself um, with with trying to dot every I and cross every T and think about what you need to set up like a year down the road when you're making a million dollars. First, focus on the business fundamentals. How are you going to actually make money? Is there a market uh, for your product? And and then figure that out. And and you know, can you get your first sale? That should really be your priority. And then as far as actually getting your your business legally set up, that's very easy to do. Um, as long as you're not in a heavily regulated industry like, uh, you know, health or, or education. But you can, you know, you can get a company registered and set up here in, in like six weeks um, for about 
$1,500. I mean, that's our price, you know, right. <laughs> um, right. that's what we to help people set up. So, um, we tend the, the, the real challenge I think is always just, do you have the right idea and the right business model around it? Um, and I think a lot of, you know, we know, we all know the majority of startups fail. People like to say 90%, but who knows really, but it does seem like a whole, the, the vast majority fail. And I think it's usually because they don't have the right idea. Um, and, uh, their friends are, their friends are too supportive and the people around them, the whole startup community is too supportive and giving them this false sense that their yeah. idea is awesome and they're not really challenged on it. Um, it's something that I, I gave a talk about recently because I realized that when people tell me their business ideas, my first instinct is always to be nice and, and sure. tell them that, Oh, that sounds really cool. You know, I think you should go for it. Like, yeah. because you want to be the jerk, right? You don't want right. to be the jerk starts asking the tough questions on somebody who's just looking for a little bit of support. Right. And you don't, and you don't always have the bandwidth or the interest in doing the free business consult of here's why your idea has is problematic. <laughs> Cause if you start, right. if you give them a real answer, a you're, you're, there's the, there's the feeling like a jerk factor, but it, what if they actually want, Oh, well let's engage on this. And then you're like, I'm just trying to get my coffee. <laughs> You know, you're just trying exactly. to move on with your day. Well, and and yeah. we'll we'll we have more to to talk about with you before we wrap up. But I, we'll put links, of course, in the show notes for this. You do have your you're offering some of your hard won wisdom by way of business services. You alluded to it, but maybe talk just a brief moment about what you're doing in terms of helping other people to set up businesses here, because you kind of brought that up. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, we we've thought about adding additional services. We have the resources. We've kind of we've gone through the ups and downs and, and dealt with a lot of challenges. So um, we figured we might as well try to help other foreigners who, who want to get their own businesses off the ground. So those services include things like registering a wholly foreign owned enterprise, um, a woofie. Um, and so getting the license you need, setting up your company bank account, uh, your accounting every month and tax filing, um, also visa services too. So whether or not you're in business, if you, if you need help getting a visa, um, we also help people set up their online stores if they want to sell on Taobao, um, and thus sell on Baopals as well, because they go hand in hand. Uh, if they want to set up official WeChat accounts so they can do their marketing or, and get their, their, uh, website or their service in WeChat. Um, we offer that as well. So it's, it's just kind of everything that we, that we've had to do. Um, and we realized that the expat market is underserved there as well, because most of the people providing these services are Chinese agencies. Right. Um, and they kind of, they tend to struggle on the communication side and the service side. Um, oftentimes you, the, the customer can be left wondering what's going on and, and, and a bit worried because they don't have a clear line of communication. Um, and so what we wanted to do was be able to provide those same services at at the same sort of competitive market rate, um, but give you a an expat who can kind of go with you hand in hand um, and and make sure that you no so, surprises come up. So speaking of that, do you see any of this counterpart like happening in in the U.S. For example, a Chinese, um, some someone like you in, in you know Chinese community helping the Chinese on or other so called expat in the U.S. Oh, to yeah. to actually use LinkedIn or Facebook to do yeah. the business successfully. Do you have some good examples of it? Yeah, is there a, a reverse version of this you're aware of back uh, back in the states? It's, for a, instance? it's a good question. Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't, you know, I haven't um, looked into it in depth, but I do know that there are people, uh, there are Chinese people based in the U.S. who will be like bulk shoppers from Taobao for their communities. Right. They will, um, and whether or not they, you mentioned uh, earlier that people are selling on Amazon um, from Taobao. That's, um, you know, that's very apparent actually for me. If I search on Amazon, I recognize Taobao products right away. But <laughs> right. there's a lot of offline activity as well. And, and I think one thing that uh, Chinese communities and Asian communities tend to do uh, when they go abroad is is really stick together and, and help each other out and not just the Asian communities. But you see that it's very apparent with Chinatown, little like Chinatown, little Tokyo, Koreatown. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I lived in L.A., right? And, and in those communities, there are people shipping and buying products from back home um, that are hard to get in the States or, or whatever country they're in and reselling them there. But that's, you know, that's a more kind of offline type of, of business. Um, but as far as adapting the Western platforms to Chinese, I haven't seen that. Um, you know, I, I don't know. 
I don't know if somebody would be able to make like a technical solution to it mm -hmm. um, where so those for audience uh, opportunity alert. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, this is this yeah. is an and interesting challenge. It's possible. I mean, yeah, it's a there's a huge Chinese community in many countries around the world now, and they're they're mostly growing. So there's got to be opportunities. Well, well, it's funny because what you mentioned, of course, we're, we're both from L.A. And so you're referencing anybody who's spent time in L.A. knows about San Gabriel. And so there <laughs> you go out there east, not east L.A., that's a whole different community, but but east of Los Angeles, the San Gabriel Mountain Valley area where you can there you can get in the middle of an intersection and you could do a turnaround in a circle. And other than the California license plate, you could swear that you're in Tongjo or something from the restaurants right. and, 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 and all the people who are from here and they tend to stick together. And, and I had often wondered about that. I mean, I had a lot of Chinese friends and clients and, and whatnot in the States. And so I would, we would often go out there for meals, which is how I got to know and love that area so much and appreciate, you know, the food. But what's really striking is that sense of community because there's some restaurants, for instance, there that I would go into and it's typical that, of course, the Chinese menu typically has a lot of pictures for everybody's sake. But there are menus that are so local where it's all just it's all just typed and there's not any English anywhere because it's for that local community. Right. They built such a strong local community, like the best dumpling place or whatever. So that's why they can stay there and have this diaspora and this really thriving sense of community. Why do you think so many expats – Stay in China so long. A lot of people come here for a bit of whether it's a, you know, post-grad adventure and I'm going to teach a few years or whether it's, you know, you know, back and forth. I mean, what, why do you, you know, maybe it's your personal story you want to relate it to, but also, of course, you know, a lot of people. Why do you think uh, China has this attraction to expats? What, what, can you put your finger on it? Well, nearly every expat you meet out here always planned to come to China for one year, except for, <laughs> students who came to get a degree um, and had a few years planned already, but hardly anybody um, imagines that they're going to be in China for more than a year. Um, and so many of them stay well beyond that. I, I'm obviously an example there, but all the friends I've made here are examples of that too. Yeah. I think, yeah, there's a, there's a myriad of reasons why people stay. Um, but I think one of the reasons is just like the Chinese communities out West, the expat community here is very strong. Um, and you make great friendships. Um, I think being being fish out of water is a very bonding experience. And I think that's kind of where it starts. The, the people who leave quickly are usually the ones who just haven't been able to find a very great close uh, friend circle. And the ones that do stay are the ones who um, have been able to, to forge some really good friendships. I think it starts there. Um, and, and, and then on top of that, I think uh, that, well, with Shanghai in particular, but I imagine any like tier one city in China, they're extremely convenient, fun places to live. You can eat and drink uh, virtually whatever you want at whatever price point you want. Mm -hmm. um, all the other conveniences as well, as far as public transport, whether it's subway systems, rental bikes, scooting around, uh, with or without a helmet, you know, if you want to just <laughs> go up. Side if you want to go for it. Yeah. <laughs> you, have a lot of you have the freedom. <laughs> <laughs> right. There's there's a convenience store on every corner, so yep. you're never far away from uh, from a quick snack or a coffee or or a water, um, anything you want. I mean, I'll sometimes travel and be like, I just want a bottle of water. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know where to go. Um, in China, you can get all of it so easily, and not to mention, you know, the the speed of things, whether it's the speed of of deliveries and payments and uh and and the speed of change as well the the city is always evolving um and i think that can allow people to feel like they're moving even though they're staying in one city because they're mm -hmm. the environment's changing around them um and there's no shortage of of things to do whether it's for for your personal life or having fun and getting involved in different uh groups and communities because there are so many when you have you know, uh, over 20 million people or 25 million people in one place. Right. Um, and then as far as work opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities as well, when you have so many people living closely together in a very changing environment and you have a very strong labor pool um, and you have a pretty low cost of living, if you, you know, if you want to keep your costs low, it's very easy to do. So you put all that together and it just, I think it just becomes uh, a very nice place to stay.
you know, as you're, as you're going through this and I'm internally relating and not wanting to say, yeah, me too, you know, 20 times. And actually my first podcast was called big fish in the middle kingdom, a play on <laughs> both, you know, trying to be a big fish in a small pond. Of course, this is the biggest pond, but also the fish out of water and how, and, and that was, that was the constant theme. I also had Chinese people on the show, but with the, with the foreigners, that was the constant theme came back to finding a sense of community and then we have all these amazing conveniences that are really hard to 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 for for people to understand unless you really spent the time here. Because I I was just back in the states for six weeks for um, mostly for business and a little bit of family stuff. And I mean, gosh, I'm, I I re- I missed my Meituan Wai Mai. I missed you know WeChat oh, yeah. Pay. I kept forgetting the first week. I kept forgetting to like put some money and a credit card in my pocket when I would leave the house, and it was totally driving me crazy. So, so why do expats feel like it's hard to explain life in China to those who haven't been here? Yeah, um, I think one of the things is, and I'm I'm dealing with it right this moment when you ask me that question, is not knowing where to start. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So many aspects, right? <laughs> Um, and there are so many, there are also, there are Western expectations, right? There, yeah. People, people have certain expectations about China, um, based on no real experience with China other than what they've seen in the media and seen in the news. Um, and just mustering up the, um, the willingness to challenge those expectations sometimes isn't, you don't even want to go there. You just want to be like, you know what, just go to China sometime and see for yourself. But, um, I think uh, a lot of those things I mentioned come as a surprise. People are surprised at how modern the cities are. They're surprised that the technology here is is often more advanced than it is out west because they've always thought that the west is, you know, is is the most advanced and most developed place in the world. Uh, people are surprised by by how easy it is to navigate the city. They think, oh, you go to China, you're just going to be completely lost. Everything's going to be Chinese. You're not going to know where you're going. And and it's not like that really at all, especially in Shanghai because it's so international. Sure. And we have and DD, then, yeah. we have DD in English now, so you can have your your Uber That's equivalent, right. you know, and, and get around really That's easily. Right. In and, English. and you just mentioned about uh, twenty four, twenty five million, right? People in Shanghai. That's giant. Size of a country. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that's that's bigger than than, than exactly. a lot of Western European hard, countries. And it's hard to explain what it's like to live in a city of 25 million people. You can't just say that uh, it's really crowded because there are pl- parts of the city that aren't crowded. Yeah, you have um, parks and, 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 and you know, temples and. So, so it just exactly. happened to me that yeah. I have this interesting uh, story, in- interesting conversation with uh, a friend from the United States. He's a Chinese American. He was dealing with a patient uh, who <laughs> who happened to be American guy and uh, has some sort of depression problem and come to China once a year, uh, mostly in Shanghai, <laughs> and I got recovered. <laughs> in oh, that, that, that's how he cured his depression. You know, I, was, I would say the guy. That story is quite popular, and uh, it was um, popular for a while, I guess in the last uh, few weeks but this guy come to Shanghai comes to Shanghai and uh, picking the subway to take and uh, once it just get into this crowd he feels like alive <laughs> and, and, and it feels like oh smells of people <laughs> and that's exactly yeah. it looks like a joke but in some way in some way I really relate it to that, we, I was I lived in Utah, right? Oh, right, yeah. You lived with like too much space in a way. Uh, too it's much gorgeous space. out there. Yeah, it's gorgeous, you know, driving but... is great. I mean, there's no people competing with you when when you have to, you know, have to drive. But uh, um, overall, that's from time to time getting into this crowd and getting out of the crowd make you feel more connected. Like for know, sure, like, totally. As an expat in China too, I feel like it's. It's hard, again, to explain that feeling because we all know what it's like to be in a crowd, but we don't all know what it's like to be in a crowd where you are you are from a completely different culture and speaking oh, yeah. a different language from everybody. <laughs> oh, yeah. it's, yep. it's it's an odd feeling. It's kind of liberating in a way it is. because it's it's like I'm I'm the different one here and everyone's just going to ignore me um, for the most part. I mean, in Shanghai, at least no one's going to stare at you for the most part. Um, but you kind of feel like you could do anything because no one is looking at you with expectations the way in the West where, you know, where you share that culture. Uh, everyone expects you to dress a certain way and to act a certain way. And if you do anything outside of the norm, then you're kind of going to be, you know, met with uh, with 
at least glances if uh, you know but possibly more whereas out here in china you kind of get a sense of like i'm in a playground um i'm just a weirdo out of water so i might as well <laughs> yeah. embrace yeah. it uh, and kind of just do whatever i want well this is it reminds me um we'll put a link in this in the show notes too as we wrapping it up here but uh you know you you must know our our friends at mama hoo hoo the uh the comedy folks the expats who have the great comedy channel and they they have one of my favorites is about basically missing china and that them them re- repatriating to new york and it's I'll, I'll find the link and put that in in the show notes because there's so many great scenarios where, you know, like the guy and his friend are in the back of the cab and they're talking very freewheeling about something. And then the cab driver starts like laughing and like, oh, yeah, man. And they're like, wait, you can understand us? <laughs> you know, <laughs> just these things exactly. that, that we take for granted here. And like they're having beers in the park and then they get arrested, you know, because an open container. Yeah, you lose your filters here. It, it's yeah. So it's kind of frustrating in that way. Totally. By the way, speaking of Mama Hoo Hoo, actually, they did a video on us uh, well, on one of what? our employees, like Day in the Life last week. Um, what? No so kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I so totally, I totally us. pulled this randomly. That that really tell that that's so funny. Yeah, they did a video. It's kind of a new series, and they it's called a day in the life. Um, oh. And this one's like a day in the life of a Chinese worker. And they, yeah, we were the first episode in that series. Uh, where our employee was. How um, cool. So you could actually check out our house in that video and um, and see a little bit behind the scenes. This is really great. I, I and for the sake of the of of. of you dear listener listening to that I mean, we did not obviously plan that i'm <laughs> i'm sitting here with just the biggest grin because that was a random I'll reference that i threw we'll... out what well, we will uh yeah, yeah. Fiving right now about small that. World, right? <laughs> nice small, small 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 world well jay thank you so much for for chatting with us we kept you a long time and you've got a business you got an empire to go build there sir what um what are <laughs> the best ways for people to you know uh to find you i'm i'm assuming you're going to give me a url or two but where are the places people can find you track you engage well, if they, they want to find uh, me personally, um, I suppose they could look me up on LinkedIn. Um, although, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to I'm trying to be more active on LinkedIn. I guess I'm getting back in that scene. Um, so just my name's Jay Thornhill. Um, and uh, really, though, the I think I want to put BalPals sure. uh, first most because that defines me. <laughs> that's what I'm all about. So it's BalPals.com. Um, and that's B-A-O-P-A-L-S because Taobao friends, right? We're your pals. Um, and uh, our WeChat account is BalPals. We put out content every week. A lot of it's quite fun. Um, and then uh, if you go to, if you're interested in like our business services, if you go to BalPals, you can find uh, business services near the top of the page, and that takes you to the website there. Um, or on mobile, it's it's in the mobile menu. Um, and uh, yeah, we also have uh, hello at BalPals.com um, in case somebody wants to shoot us an email um, for whatever reason. We're looking awesome. forward to having more great content from you, from Bao Pals. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Hey, it's a pleasure. I think you guys are doing great stuff. Um, there's so much for, for I think, us and, and the world to learn and share about China. So um, keep it up. Great interview. What is your big takeaway, Brendan? Well, for me, I am probably most impressed with the simple fact that they built their business from the inside out instead of the outside in. A lot of entrepreneurs will be trying to look ahead at the horizon and look at opportunities that are underserved, and that's a valid approach. But they actually started by working to fulfill a need they had. They wanted to use Taobao. They didn't read great Chinese, and they built this thing to do it. And then it turns out a lot of other people Want that too. How about you? What was something that really stuck with you? Well, I was impressed that he's not someone who just came to China to make quick money, but instead he used patience, persistence, and the wisdom about people to help him succeed. It is a great example of how to do China right. One that I think more people will follow the lead and learn from. I think that's a great point. Don't forget to visit HowChinaWorksPodcast.com to learn more about us and learn how to do China right from our perspective. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week on How China Works.